Um, okay. Um, it's early, and let's pray. Father, uh, this Provo area um, is God's country, not Mormon country. You own Provo. You own Orem. You own all the nature that beautifully surrounds this little church. Um, you told Adam and Eve to bear fruit, be fruitful, to multiply, and your word says that you've made man a little lower than the angels, <clears throat> and you've given, him glo- you've given him a dominion over the earth, jurisdiction over creation, so that we could spread the majestic name over all the earth. Lord, we want the majestic name of you to be spread throughout the rest of Provo and Orem. Um, how unfitting that this beautiful country would be full of polytheism. Uh, how fitting would it be for you to be tr- truly worshipped as you are in this beautiful valley. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. <clears throat> so my goal for the next, say, 40 minutes um, is to give you some tools that you can use today with conversations with Mormons that don't require a um, developed competency or fascination with or intense study of Mormonism. So I want you to have tools that you can start using today to have productive and fruitful conversations. I am going to give you a list of questions that you can ask, and I do think it'd be helpful to write them down for your own active listening and memory. Um, So let's just hit the ground running. Um, I go down to Temple Square most Thursdays, three seasons a year, and most of what we do is conversational evangelism, and this is what we call a stranger evangelism context, and uh, it's very awkward um, to start religious conversations with strangers, period. Uh, There's no way to smooth that out, so it's not awkward anymore. So what I like to tell my friends who are new to it is just own the awkwardness and punch through it with, with boldness um, because God loves you and he loves these people. Um, but there's things we can do when we're starting these conversations to help people feel a little more comfortable talking to us and that it's a safe place to have a conversation and that we love them and that we're not trying to uh, be a, too aggressive with them in a relational way. So here's some questions I use on the street. Um, I might hand a tract out, um, and these questions can work in a relational context too. But what I, what I look for when I hand a tract out is body language. If somebody looks like they want to book it, they do not want to talk with me, I let them have the tract, and I, I don't press. But if there's like, it's really interesting, there's a little bit of a body language, a nonverbal signal that they're a little curious, and so then I'll ask a question like, um, <clears throat> this isn't part of my list here, but where are you from? Uh, what brings you to Salt Lake City? Um, uh, what, what brings you here today? And there's a variety of reasons people come downtown. And after getting to know a little bit about them, here's my first significant question uh, to remember is, uh, did you ever go on a mission? Did you ever go on a mission? Did you go on a mission? And that's a really special question to ask in Utah because a mission for Mormons is not merely an exam- it's not merely an opportunity to share their faith for two years. It's almost a kind of coming of age uh, transition, life transition for them. And some of their sweetest memories, uh, and I, I'm even talking for about ex-Mormon Christians would say this too, some of their sweetest memories of God working in their life and speaking to them and uh, helping them grow up and mature are on their mission. So when you ask someone, where'd you go on your mission? Um, there's a little bit of a chest comes out. It's just, I went to Argentina. And then there's a little bit of pride too. Like I got, I got to go to a cool place. <laughs> I got to go to, you know, and there's a, there's a love that LDS people develop for where they go to. They learn to love the people where they live. And so um, I love asking that because I'm getting to know What's dear to a person? Where did you go? Um, I'll ask, these are little sub points on this question. So this is just question number one. I like to ask, um, you know, where'd you go? Uh, Can 
I'll ask open-ended questions even. I'll say, can you tell me a little bit more about your experience? Or what are some things that stood out from your mission? Or um, what, are some of your fav- what are some of your favorite memories from your mission? Um, and I'm not, this isn't just a means to an end. I'm really interested to know uh, this about their mission. Um, so if you want to get someone's eyes to light up, that's a pretty low-hanging fruit question. And you don't need to know a lot of, about Mormonism to ask that. Second question, uh, where did you grow up? Um, this is just question number two. Where did you grow up? And the, the, uh, really the heart of this question is, did you have any born-again Christian friends growing up there? So when people say, I, I grew up in Santa Quin, or I grew up in Provo. Oh, cool. Did you ever have any born-again Christian friends growing up, say, in middle school or high school, when you grew up in that area? There's a dual purpose here of this, of this question. It's to get to know um, what existing exposure someone already has to born-again Christianity, but it's also to help provoke our heart to more compassion over just how lost these people are. That people, um, uh, uh, full disclosure, I went to bed at like 2 a.m. I'm really tired. (laughs) So have mercy on me. I'm not trying to be weepy. Um, But a lot of people we talked to in um, Utah haven't had any born again Christian friends growing up at all. But sometimes you'll have a, a, some, a Mormon who says, oh, yeah, I had, a, I had a Christian friend in high school. His name was Jimmy. It was great. We, we, you know, we, we played chess together. We played basketball together. I don't know, something like that. Um, I'm a nerd. So. Um, so that helps you get a sense of their meaningful relational exposure already to other Christians. <clears throat> Third question. And this is relevant to both the first and the second. Did you ever talk about God together with uh, your born-again Christian friend? Um, and the, the variant on that for related to question one is, um, did you ever get to talk to any born-again Christian friends, uh, not friends, but did you ever get to talk to any born-again Christians on your mission? Now, every... Uh, almost every LDS person you talk to will say, yep, <laughs> yes. And uh, they might be polite about it. It's, oh, yeah, they were delightful people. I loved them. Or they might be in a Bible Belt situation. They're like, yeah, we, we, yeah they gave us a hard time. <laughs> so uh, I, I don't ever want to apologize for the boldness of a believer who shared the gospel in good conscience. So I don't want to make friends by throwing any other believers into the bus there. So I want to be real careful about that. But if they were rudely treated, if they were uh, inappropriately uh, engaged with, um, I could say, oh, I'm, I'm sorry about that. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry about that to hear that. Or, more often, um, it's just simply, oh yeah, we got to talk to a whole lot of born-again Christians. Then I like to ask, what did you discuss? What did you talk about? This is just an extension of the, the third question already. Um, what did you talk about? Did you ever talk about God together? Did you ever have any gospel conversations together? Now, I want you to know that my agenda here, uh, in addition to getting to know the LDS person I'm talking to, is I want you to imagine a kind of table that you're both sitting at, and I want my LDS conversation partner to, if they can, put topics on the table for me. So I want them to introduce topics that we can then talk about. So I, if, if you want to grow in your evangelism, how about this as a goal, a growth goal? Learn to help other Latter-day Saints initiate topics on their own that you can then develop conversations out of. So what did you talk about? Did you ever have any gospel conversations? Um, here's a fourth question, and this one is also meant to provoke our own hearts, a sense of how lost the LDS people are. Um, have you ever heard a born-again Christian explain the gospel before? This is question number four. 
Have you ever heard a born-again Christian summarize the gospel? Have you ever, have you ever heard a, a, uh, an evangelical, you can insert the, your favorite term here, explain the gospel before or summarize the gospel or present their faith before? And um, this is really helpful because if they say, yes, I can say, what did they say? <laughs> I, I, I'm not initiating much, am I? I'm getting them to put topics on the table. And if they give me a really, really bad answer, perhaps out of having misheard what the Christian said or the Christian maybe in an inadequate presentation or maybe it's an awesome conversation that you now get to build on, right? Or corroborate. You can say, what did they say? Uh, what do you think? Uh, uh, okay, um, so, um, if they say, no, I've actually never heard a born-again Christian present the gospel before. What do you think is a good thing to say then? And I, I, would, I would literally start the next sentence with, may I? May I please share the gospel with you? Um, again, I'm, I'm tired. Um, and if they look like they don't want to give you much time, you can say, it'd only take a few minutes. Um, or if it looks like it's a context where you can get 20, 30 minutes out, then you can hit the ground running. They've invited you to, you've asked to, you know in your heart they've never heard it before, or perhaps they, they have heard it and they've explained what they did here, and they've already, hopefully at this point, tried to summarize what they think our message is through existing conversations. So here's another question. Uh, my, my numbering is probably off here. One, two, three, four, five. Are we on five now? Mm -hmm. This is a general purpose uh, question that can help you um, with a lot of topics. Um, have you ever heard a born-again explanation for that before. So the idea is that there is a specific topic now that you're talking about, and there's some wild misconception. Um, so think about how eager you are in your uh, spirit to say, that's not true. That's not what the Bible says. That is wrong. That is an error. That is heresy. That offends the living God. Well, before we get there, that might be an appropriate place to get into and express, but before we get there, what often is the case is not that the LDS person you're talking to has understood and rejected the thing you're really trying to promote. It's that they have never heard a clear explanation of, of what we're trying to communicate. So before there's a, uh, and I want to be really careful here not to throw debate under the bus, especially because last night I did a formal debate, but um, in conversation, there is a place at times, and this is a part of growing as a Christian uh, in your engagement with the lost, there is a time and a place for rebuke, reproof, reproof exhort. Uh, Paul says in 2 Timothy 2, um, don't be quarrelsome, but correct and teach with gentleness and patience. There is a time for that to get to the correction stage, firmly even. But before we get there, I think there's a great opportunity. It's low-hanging fruit of exp explanation. So have you ever heard a born-again Christian explanation of that before? Say the nature of God or the gospel or the reliability of scriptures. Um, okay, that's really helpful to me because it invites... Uh, it. Um, if they say no, you say, may I explain? And if they say yes, what can you say? If you say, have you ever heard a born-again explanation for that topic before? And they say yes, what do you say? What did they say? And so uh, I'm getting my LDS friend here to say as much as possible, I am a chronic monologuer. Um, if you give me a gospel opportunity to share the gospel, I will talk your ear off. And sometimes I have to manage that in my own evangelism. 
And even say, well, if I'm going to monologue, it's better be the words of God, <laughs> Jesus' stories, and things that bring glory to him. But my, uh, the things I have to do, that Aaron has to do in his evangelism, is work hard to listen and to get the other person to talk. Um, as a side note, if I could give you uh, one piece of advice for helping conversations last longer, so that there's not anxieties and tensions that cause it to exit pretty quickly. It's just the slow down. That's it. Two words. Slow down. Slow down. Slow down your pace, your rhythm. We live in Utah. I live in Salt Lake. You live in Provo, perhaps. Um, we live in a culture that's not like Chicago, and it is not like New York. My goodness. I remember at the North Gate of Temple Square, um, I had this really interesting place. It's a cultural epicenter. There are people there for tourism and um, business conventions, and, to, and the temple, of course. But I remember talking to an ex-Muslim Iranian lady. And she was an older lady. She was very short. And I um, tried to have a peaceful conversation with her. And she pointed her finger at my chest. And she was, she was why are you out here? And, and she was very interested in Mormonism. She was actually, it was kind of a weird situation. It doesn't even sound real when I say it out loud. She was an ex-Muslim Iranian in Utah, who was, if not, to my memory, uh, favorably at investigating Mormonism. And she was really upset that I was out there, and she was super wired, and she thought it was condescending that I was talking slowly to her. And for me, at her level, to have a respectful conversation, so I had to amp it up and talk with her and be more energetic and animated. And I felt really bad for the Mormons walking by because we were just going at it and stuff like that. And, and at the end, she gave me a big hug. And she said, oh, thank you for talking with me. You know, just two minutes later, though, she had her finger on my chest. And she was like, and I was like, okay, I'm sorry. And, but that was just her, you know. I didn't take it personally. And um, she was an animated person. And she was enthusiastic and passionate. She did not take my elevated passion offensively. She's not like Utahns, right? We live in a really sensitive state, uh, oversensitive even, hypersensitive. So uh, we can't bow to that culture completely and say, well, I guess I shouldn't share truth. But what we can do is we try to graciously accommodate the culture a little bit and we can do that by slowing down, really, really just slowing down. Um, this would be six. May I, and this one's really straightforward in the conversation. May I show you a verse from the Bible on that? And um, what's really cool about pulling your Bible out is that, man, that's a lot of artillery and power and authority. And God accomplishes his effective work through the sharing of the word of God. Um, and there is, a, there is an appropriateness to us presenting the Word of God as the Word of God. It's not a perspective merely. It's not just our viewpoint. Um, but Mormons get anxious about pulling out my Bible. Um, there, you know, there's a sensitivity there to Bible bashing, they call it. Um, you know, we think with David in Psalm 19, the Word of God is precious. It's like honey. Uh, the wounds, the, when scripture wounds us, we're like, please, yes, faithful wounds, Lord. We love you. You would only do this because you would love us. And, and when we hear a hard sermon, we gobble up the discomfort and we say, yes, pastor, press into my conscience. Make me feel bad about my sin. I want to know Jesus better and I want to have a clearer view of the gospel. The Mormons aren't there, right? So when we pull out our scriptures, it's just nice to have a polite way to introduce it. May I show you a verse? in the Bible about that. And so uh, literally what I do is I open it up. I actually have like an old grandpa extra large print Bible for the street where I can, these little Bibles today are so hard to read. Yeah. Um, and you, I, I'll open it up and um, again, I'll put my finger under the text and read slowly. And if you think, well, do I need to have a King James Bible for this? No, no, not in 2018. When I was doing this 10 years ago, I had a whole lot more, well, I don't trust your translation kind of stuff. That is really rare today. Um, so I would encourage you to use a modern English translation of the Bible. And if there's any rare objection to what translation you're using, just pull out your phone, pull up the King James. Not a big deal. 
It's more important that they hear the word of God very clearly than it is that we preempt any translation objections. So the question there, I think it was number six, may I show you a verse from the Bible on that, on that subject? Now here's question number seven. I think this will be my last of the questions that I'm listing. And this is a magical question. Uh, this is a silver bullet, not really. Um, no, but this, this is a great question um, if your mind goes blank in an evangelistic conversation, if you feel like you freeze up um, and you don't know what to say, um, just put this on your tool belt. It happens to me all the time where I'm like, uh, and you have to have things when your mind goes blank. You have to have stuff that's nearest to you in terms of accessibility, like, the, like your garage. When you grab the tools that are right near the door, this is one of those. What would you say are some of the biggest differences between Mormonism and, you might say, evangelical Christianity? Or you might say traditional Christianity or classical Christianity or mainstream, whatever. So I'll say that again. What would you say are some of the biggest differences or what would you say are the biggest differences between Mormonism and traditional Christianity Let's put some bullet points underneath that one. You might get lame answers to that. Um, or you might get good answers, but they're not really the kind of interesting ones you're looking for. So you might hear, well, continuing revelation. That is to say that we can add more scripture and have prophets and apostles today with, that speak with the same kind or even greater authority than we have in our scripture. Um, I actually think that's, an, that's a super important topic. That's like unavoidably important, right? That's just terribly important. But I actually consider the nature of God and the gospel um, to be more important, I think. It's hard. You know, we're, like, com- we're like comparing infinitely important things. But um, So if your conversation partner, if your friend, your new acquaintance says, um, something like, um, well, uh, we believe in the Book of Mormon. I was like, yeah, um, by the way, this, I, this is good to say because I had this misconception 20 years ago. No, 50, I don't know, um, as well. Just, this just kind of free you up. Uh, the Book of Mormon was published in 1830 when Mormonism had yet to become radically heretical in its beliefs. And if you have a friend that moves to Utah and they're like, so good to meet you. Wow, I just got the missionaries at my door and everyone's bringing me cookies and I have no idea about Mormonism. What should I read to learn about the LDS faith? You don't tell them to read the Book of Mormon because it's published in 1830 and it's essentially a monotheistic sort of evangelifish with some weird things in it. In its original context, sounds like a Protestant-ish book. Really doesn't teach all the things that make Mormonism most interesting. So when Mormons say the Book of Mormon is what makes their religion interesting, I, I smile and listen, but in the back of my head I'm thinking, that's not what makes your religion interesting. That's not the, it doesn't have the teachings. Of course it's got huge implications. It's, it's the writings of a false prophet and the voice of a false shepherd. But, okay, back to my point here. Uh, we, we just asked our conversation partner, what do you think are some of the biggest differences between... When I say, dif- I'll, when I say differences, I'll say often qualify, what do you think are some of the biggest doctrinal differences? What do you think are some of the biggest theological differences? What do you think are some of the biggest teaching differences between Mormonism and evangelical Christianity? And if they give you other answers, uh, answers that don't seem super interesting, just say, huh, what else? Literally, that's literally. It's a sub bullet point. Okay, what else? What else? And what I'm looking for is how we get saved. They don't, they don't use that language, but who God is, um, the authority of Jesus. Um, and actually, I'll extend this for you. I want you to be on the lookout for topics that you think that you can fruitfully discuss. So get them to keep talking about those differences 
Isn't this cool? Because we're the ones usually who are like, I need to tell you, there are huge differences and I want to initiate this list here for you and I have them ranked right now. Would you please go? <laughs> but I want Maldi's friends instead to put the, their list on the table and I now have a list from which I can take a topic and expand on it. So you're looking for them to introduce a topic that you can discuss now and now you can ask the questions of, um, have you ever talked to a born-again Christian about that? Have you ever heard of a born-again Christian explanation for that? Have, may I show you a Bible verse about that? So, um, I think that's a good place to stop. And I hope that helps you today even. Even if you can knock on your door, or if you're talking to someone um, out in public, or even a neighbor. And I, I want you to be encouraged that you do not need to be an expert on Mormonism. It is responsible for you as a citizen of Utah to learn the faith of your neighbors, to effectively engage and to be curious about the people that you love and, and you want to know the gospel. So it's responsible to be here and to learn this kind of stuff. But before you do know that kind of stuff, you can start having productive and fruitful conversations uh, that last quite some time without yet having a, a serious competency in terms of knowing the, the intricacies of Mormonism. So thank you. Yes, I would love that. Um, I stopped myself from doing that because I think I need like five, 10 minutes to do that, but I don't want to well, disrespect. 15. 15, oh, okay. So new topic, um, I'll add a, is it number, what number, question are we at now? Um, eight, eight would be, um, and I'll give you a little variation of it, is really simple. What did Jesus say about that in the four Gospels? Actually, the way I, I, the way I ask that is to say, um, I usually set this one up with a few questions. I ask, with respect to their mission, they are given uh, scheduled time in the mornings for scripture reading. So I like to ask people who've been on a mission, or even recently, or youth, um, or young adults that have been on a mission, um, did you get to read the New Testament on your mission? Um, and there's a little bit of a funnel here happening. Cool. Um, what did you read? Uh, what stuck out to you? Or what did you most enjoy in the New Testament? This also helps provoke within us a sense of compassion about, and, and of realism that our LDS neighbors, while they have proof texts they use from the New Testament, they often aren't as familiar as you think they are with the basics. So um, I funnel that down to, did you ever get to read the four Gospels on your mission? And there's a kind of gushing Standard answer of, oh, yes, I did, and I loved them. And so the, the next question is for me is, which of the four Gospels for you is your favorite? And um, you might say the Gospel of John or the Gospel of Matthew. And a sincere question, follow up to that, is funneling down, what are, what are your same, some of your favorite parts of the Gospel of John, the Gospel of Matthew. Oh, the Gospel they said was their favorite. What are some of your favorite things in the book? What, what in the book stood out to you? And um, you kind of have to be careful here because you're getting into shame territory pretty quickly here because they start, you start realizing that despite their gushing um, testimony of how much they've loved reading these books, they don't remember much at all from them. Um, so... Um, there's a little bit of a, uh, I don't really remember much anymore about that. Or they might have some favorite parts. So um, anyway, that kind of provides a little bit of a funnel. And um, with people who aren't, aren't on recent missions or so forth, it's, you just variate that and you say, um, do you read the New Testament um, Regularly, do you enjoy it? Uh, or maybe that's maybe kind of an offensive question even you saw, but I, you can instead ask, what are some of your, it, it's just a variation, what are some of your favorite 
books of the New Testament? What's your favorite of the four Gospels? What do you most love about it? So that's my setup. And I've sort of aimed an arrow at one of the four Gospels to those questions. And if you align that with topics that were brought up through the other questions, you can then ask a bridging question. And the bridging question is, well, what did Jesus say about that? Um, I'll give you some freebies here, uh, real examples. The authority of Jesus, the temple, and family. Those are really important topics to Mormons, and those get brought up in those other questions. So I like to ask, what did Jesus say in the four Gospels about that? The way I ask it is, what would you say? Because it's not like a pop quiz question framing. I wanted to kind of like frame it in sort of a polite conversational way. What would you say our, uh, Jesus taught in the four Gospels about his authority? So I'm going to give you some specific examples that I use on the street. And my agenda here on the street is to get to a place where if I'm going to monologue for a few minutes, it's going to be Jesus stories. And if I'm going to be weird, it's because I get really excited about Jesus stories. And what's really cool about this is there's a whole lot in the four Gospels that's super relevant to the engagement of Mormonism and Mormons um, than we realize. So when the topic of families is brought up, I ask, what would you say Jesus taught about the family in the four Gospels? And there's typically a... um, I don't know. I forget. I'd have to check my scriptures. Um, So the gentle transition is, do you remember when? Do you remember when Jesus said? um, Or I'll say, uh, may I share a Jesus story with you? Do you remember when the time that Jesus said? That's my intro. And with 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 the family thing, it's really interesting. Jesus doesn't say very many positive things about the nuclear family. Um, well, in, in the four Gospels, Jesus severely, he, he um, prepares his disciples for the severe consequences of discipleship and the cost. And he says, if anyone be, would be my disciple, he must hate his father, his mother, and his wife, and his child. Uh, and he says elsewhere in a comparable way, if you don't love me more than you love your own family, you can't be my disciple. And another time, Jesus was in a really crowded room and it was a Justin Bieber moment. He's too much of a crowd. Can't get close to him. And his parents, his family, his, parents, his, uh, his mom and his siblings are freaking out. Uh, man, you can't even have a meal in a house. You're so popular right now. This is getting out of hand. They're trying to get a hold of them. And um, you can, what, the way I'm sharing it with you right now, I, I kind of lose myself in these stories. And that's how I do it with my Mormon friends too. So, um, so they're trying to get near him. You just, you just enjoy yourself in this, by the way. If you want a, a long-term, emotional, durable, uh, non-burnout sort of evangelistic energy, enjoy what you're doing. Enjoy sharing the stories of Jesus. Well, they tried to get a hold of Jesus, and they sent for him, and, and they said, hey, Jesus, your uh, mom and your, your brothers are looking for you. They want you out. Uh, you know, and Jesus says, whoever does the will of my Father in heaven is my mother and my <laughs> sibling. And so Jesus, Jesus, what he does, though, is he reorients the family, around those who do the will of the Father in heaven. Um, Jesus is also asked in Matthew 22 by Sadducees who are mocking the, fair, uh, the, the, uh, sorry, the uh, resurrection. And they, um, they say, okay, Jesus. There was a woman who had a husband, and um, he died. And his brother married the woman, and he died. And I uh, heard Chip Thompson once joked that she was a really bad cook. Um, really, really bad cook. And uh, anyway, a succession of what, six or seven husbands, and they all died. And then um, <clears throat> the Sadducees asked Jesus, which one will she be married to in the resurrection? And Jesus says, you, you don't know the power of God, and you don't know the scriptures. At the resurrection, they will neither be married, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage, but they shall be as the angels. So what I've just done is I've primed my listener for something with Jesus stories. Jesus says, you got to give up your whole family 
You need to reorient your sense of family around to who, those, who do the will of the Father in heaven. And the afterlife is not... The resurrection makes marriage look boring. I remember a BYU professor trying to shame me in front of my wife once. It was so beautiful. It was awesome. He, uh, he looked to her and he said to my wife, Stacy, don't you want to be married to your husband forever? And she said with this sort of resignation, no. <laughs> I'm going to be with Jesus. I don't know my husband, but we won't be married and I won't need to be. And it was like, I wanted to like kiss her madly, you know. It was just so counterintuitive to, my, to the people in the room. Um, but like, it was the most romantic thing she's ever said to me. <laughs> because, and I mean this, uh, she loves Jesus and our marriage is not an idol um, to her. And she does not think that I am going to ultimately satisfy her. Um, her Lord Jesus Christ is her creator and her Lord. And um, our marriage is in service of the Lord Jesus Christ while on earth for the sake of proclaiming his name until we die, period. So anyway, those three stories. And so you, what, what the, the wrap-up is, after sharing a... So here's the goal for you. I'll give you a resource, too, that would help. It's called the LUMO Project. L-U-M-O Project. And it's modern, super modern, recently done word-for-word word Jesus videos of all four Gospels, and they're awesome. They're so awesome. I uh, will put it, a speaker, Bluetooth shower speaker in my shower and play it and put it in my car for the commute. Imagine listening to 20 to 30 minutes of one of the four Gospels for the rest of your life and getting to know the words of Jesus. Jesus says, if you hear his words and do them, you'll build your life on a strong foundation. And he says to the apostles, go, preach, teach, baptize, and make disciples, teaching them to observe everything I've commanded you. So here's your goal, to get to know the four Gospels so well that when your Mormon conversation partner brings up a topic that they've initiated through the questions you've asked, you have in mind... Three Jesus stories, hopefully, relevant to it. And then, here's the wrap-up, here's the ending. You asked at the beginning, what did Jesus say about that? And then you transition, do you remember when Jesus said? And maybe even as you're telling the story, they have some familiarity. So you're allowing them conversationally um, to fill in the blanks. You know, when, when Jesus was in the room and they punched a hole in the wall and the friends lowered their friend through the cot and they lowered him and everyone was freaking out and they all looked at Jesus. What's he going to say? And Jesus looks at the man and he says, remember that? And, and the Mormon's like, yeah, he said, your sins are forgiven. And you're like, yes, he said, your sins are forgiven. And all the disciples, all the Pharisees were thinking in their hearts like, remember that? They said, only God can forgive sins. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Only God forgives sins. You're involving your conversation partner, perhaps not as enthusiastically, but you're, you're involving your conversation partner in the storytelling because they might have some familiarity. And if there's anything where, if there's any place in the conversation where they can participate, you want them to participate, right? So at the end of sharing the three Jesus stories, you say, again, so how would, you, how would you summarize what Jesus says about this topic in the four Gospels? And it's really awkward to talk Mormonism at that point because you have the authority of the words of Jesus speaking on it to a topic. So, Thank you so much. I hope this has been a productive, fruitful blessing to you. So.